courtroom. They are charged in the brutal rape, torture, and murder of an Air Force veteran in her own home. That's her picture, 64-year-old Marilyn Ferris. One of the suspects, Victor Ramirez, is an illegal immigrant arrested six times within a year and a half, but never deported. It's a case that's throwing even more fuel on the debate over sanctuary city laws. Let's bring in our legal panel, Eric Guster and Brian Claypool. Both of them are criminal defense attorneys. Brian, you practice in California where this crime took place, Santa Maria. A guy who's been arrested uh, six times, 18 months. One of them was for attempted sexual, sexual assault. How's that guy out walking the streets? Hey, John, I was actually on your show a few weeks ago with Kate Steinle. Remember her? Oh, sure, similar Beautiful case. young lady in San Francisco shot and killed by an undocumented alien. Same problem there. This is absolutely outrageous. It's pathetic. And these sanctuary, so-called sanctuary laws, I would call them septic laws because they stink. Number one, they're putting people at risk. They're, they're endangering people. And number two, more important, these sanctuary laws are at odds with the federal laws, the federal immigration and custom laws. So when, when a state law is at odds with the federal law, the federal law should control under the Supremacy Clause. And in every state where there's a sanctuary law, the state attorney general should file a, a lawsuit and have these sanctuary laws repealed. Proponents of the sanctuary laws, Eric, among other things, say, well, we need them so that uh, undocumented people who are here illegally will come forward and tell us if they know about crimes. Is that the case? And, and is it worth the trade-off? Part of the trade-off works, but when someone has been arrested six, seven, eight times and go out and kill a retired veteran, that's the problem. And so we, we have these sanctuary cities and these sanctuary problems where people want illegal aliens to come forward. If they're victims of crime, they know something about a crime, that's different. But when you have people who have been arrested over and over and over and they're never checked, and for the federal agencies to never check and see, does this person need to be deported because of their criminal history? Because we, with, when we have people with extensive criminal histories, we need to send them back to where they came from. I mean, it's, it's too late for Marilyn Ferris to get justice, but could her heirs, should they sue somebody, maybe even including the federal government? Well, I think they should sue the, the local law enforcement that, that let Ramirez back out on the street, just as I said a few weeks ago on your show, that the Steinle family should sue the San Francisco Police Department. And here's why. It's just what Eric's talking about. There are massive red flags. This wasn't just a first-time misdemeanor, and they missed this guy. Ramirez had six prior arrests, and you I mentioned one was... was one was felony threat. assault with intent to commit sexual, sexual battery. He was convicted of misdemeanor battery. Exactly. Bingo, red flag. What do we need to do now? Legislate common sense within local law enforcement? If I was the heirs to her family, I would sue that local police department for negligence. And that's the type of case that they need to get red flags. Just like what Brian was just saying. When you have a sexual assault, a potential assault, a felony assault, those are the type of people that the feds need to come in and look at. If you're jaywalking, let that person out. Speeding, let that person out. But something serious, those people need to be investigated because those are the ones that escalate quickly to murder, kidnapping, and rape. It's, it's a little unclear exactly what happened in this guy's history. At one point, we are told he was targeted, Ramirez was targeted for deportation by Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. But at the same time, we're also told uh, that he was never turned over to federal authorities by the local authorities who were picking him up. Right. And it's, did you hear the excuse given by the, the local sheriff? He was allegedly afraid of a lawsuit by the ACLU. Mm -hmm. I really got a kick out of that because these local law enforcement agencies aren't afraid whenever there's an excessive force case, and we've seen a lot of those across the country. They're not afraid of a lawsuit there, but all of a sudden, we're afraid of the ACLU. That is a cop-out, and they were also blaming Prop 47 in California. That was another pathetic cop-out. That's the one that says if you're picked up with a minor amount of marijuana or drugs, if it's small, uh, you're not going to see a felony criminal charge, right? Right. And that's, that does cover the, the small amounts of marijuana. But just what, what we were just discussing, when you have those red flags, something needs to be done. And for a sheriff to say, I was afraid of the ACLU, that they may sue me. Well, we are afraid of people, not of very violent people, getting out of jail, 
getting out of prison and reoffending, and that is what's happening, and we're seeing it over and over and over. The police chief also said there is a trail of blood that starts in Washington, D.C., where some of these laws get passed and, and runs all the way to her bedroom where she was killed. you agree? No, the trail of blood is in the backyard of the local law enforcement that dropped the ball here. And I think one possible solution we can have, John, maybe, is to have the federal government issue a, under the 14th Amendment, they can issue a parallel law to have, the, to have the federal law apply equally in the states. In other words, that would help repeal these sanctuary laws. You think anybody? Part, of it, part of it is the federal system because sometimes the feds are very slow about these things. Even outside the sanctuary cities, if someone is holding, if a local law enforcement agency is holding someone and feds don't come, they have to release them. They simply don't have space. And that's another issue that the other cities are having where if they are holding someone on an ice hold or or some other type of hole to see whether or not the feds want to deport them, they don't have, they don't have room. Just as in the Steinle case, you just feel so sorry for the survivors of this woman. I mean, yeah. it is such an unnecessary, ridiculous case, and, 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 and there's just no explanation for the dropping of the ball. Yeah. No logical explanation. John, that, John, the, the town has happened into, I'm familiar with it. It's a small town. Mm -hmm. So if this local law enforcement wants to come to you and I and say, oh, there's so many inmates here, we can't keep track, that, that is not a good excuse. Brian, Brian Claypool and Eric Guster, thanks. We'll, we'll stay on top of this case. Thanks, John. Thank Jenna. you.